the sound of a door slowly creaking open in the room that I've fallen asleep in wakes me up. This is a real life horror story I'm about to tell you. Only in this case, I'm both the killer and the victim here. It's the day after Christmas 2009 and I'm in my doctor's waiting room because the day before I went to the emergency room for my very first EKG to rule out the possibility that I just had my first heart attack. Now don't be alarmed. In my family, heart attacks are a rite of passage. Every male has had at least a couple. But at the age of 30, I'm setting a brand new record because I already weigh in at 440 pounds. I just learned that number because my scale at home actually only goes up to 400 pounds. I was completely humiliated and embarrassed. As my doctor walked into the room, I looked down to avoid his gaze, humiliated. I see my huge stomach resting on the middle of my thighs, my chest heaving, just struggling to keep myself alive. I've reached a point where I'm out of control. My 5XL shirt and 60-inch pants are draped over a chair in the corner. And I stand to greet my doctor, my knees popping underneath me like a sound of microwave popcorn. Good morning, Mr. Bauer, Dr. Grayson says to me. I've got good news and bad news for you. He's speaking with all of the warmth and sincerity of a man who's about to deliver a death sentence. Without waiting to hear what I prefer to hear first, he tells me the good news is that as you found out yesterday, you didn't have a heart attack. Unfortunately, your acid reflux medicine doesn't appear to be working anymore. <sighs> Thank God. The bad news wasn't that bad. Only he wasn't finished. The bad news is that you're at very high risk for having a heart attack anytime. He reads off a list of carefully prepared pre-diseases. I'm pre-diabetic, pre-hypertension, pre-high cholesterol. But what he doesn't know is that I'm struggling with a number of post-diseases as well that I've struggled with since high school. I'm post-depression, I'm post-caring, I'm post-suicidal, I'm post not long for this world. This is not a story about the moment that everything changed in my life, although it probably should have been. No, this was a familiar song on the radio that I'd heard a hundred times and I could sing along with the lyrics without being affected one bit. I was 19 years old the first time I received this death sentence where a doctor told me that my life would likely be shortened and would have zero quality because of my lifestyle. By the age of 30, I'd received five death sentences. This was nothing new. No, for me, overcoming obesity and learning how to fight addiction didn't come until I began to understand that eating was a symptom and not the disease itself. Eating is the one addiction on earth where people sell commercial products designed to try to fight it. No one sells a shake designed to cure alcoholism. Nobody sells a pill that will help you overcome your addiction to gambling. It is only in obesity that marketers try to pervade us. And so I had attempted every single diet on earth. If there was a, a soup, a shake, or a supplement that promised to help me shed pounds, I would immediately go for it and I would try it. And the second I would hit a plateau or other obstacle, I would give up and see it as evidence that I was born to be fat. For me, a diet was like taking an aspirin because my finger was caught in a mouse trap. It would maybe solve the pain, but it wouldn't really address the problem. Now, in my experience in both work and in my personal life, I have found that all of us struggle with similar things when we're trying to set a goal or objective, that we will hit a plateau. We will find a place where we start to experience pain and fear, and that will immediately make us give up. Maybe you're like me. Maybe you have a playlist of goals that you set every single year for New Year's resolutions or maybe professional goals. This is the year I finally take school seriously. Maybe this is the year where I start spending more time with my family, or this is the year where I really get my stuff together. What happens? Well, perhaps you're like me, and you actually never fail on any of these goals. You just quit on them. See, with dieting, it was really easy to quit because I could blame everything on my metabolism, or I was big boned, or my father's this way, so I'm born to be this way as well. It's outside of my control. 
No, it wasn't until I gave, my permission, gave, my, gave myself permission to start actually failing and stop quitting that I finally found a way out. It is one of my life's greatest ironies that a fear of losing actually kept me from losing weight. So when I finally hit that place where I was ready to make my change and I'd given myself permission, I failed a lot. I was imperfect the whole time. And in one year, I managed to just lose one pound, but I did it 225 times. By learning how to fail, I became my best self. Now, when I was doing all of this weight loss stuff, I started to keep a blog and started to write articles and started to do media appearances, and I started to hear from people across the country who were struggling with their own addictions. Most of the time, they were obese people, but a lot of the times, I was hearing from uh, people that were in Alcoholics Anonymous or addicted to other substances, and they started to share their fears with me. What were they really concerned about? And I found, in the case of obesity, one fear kept coming up over and over, and that was loose skin. A lot of YouTubers had posted videos, people who had lost a lot of weight, and they had shown off their loose skin, and people were terrified that they would end up looking like that. Even people who, like me, had received diagnoses from doctors saying that they would die if they didn't do something about this problem, actually used loose skin as an excuse not even to get started. So I published an article all about loose skin, and it started to go viral and started to hit some social networks, and a, a television production company actually picked up that article and came across my blog and talked to me about a television show that they were putting together about loose skin removal. And I saw this as a great opportunity to show people that loose skin should not hold them back from achieving their dream life. It seemed kind of strange to me that people who were in danger of dying would allow something so cosmetic to get in the way. So I said yes to the show, and they selected me, and I appeared on the series premiere of their television show, and I was really excited. They filmed my life as I ran my businesses and raised my two beautiful daughters and just enjoyed life in general. And I thought that I had finally shown the world that loose skin was not something that should get in the way of them achieving true happiness. Now, I see you in the audience, and I, I know most of you at home probably aren't struggling with obesity. But like me, you probably have something you want to achieve, and you allow a small fear or a small pain to stand between you and this goal. After the show aired, I thought I'd done it, and I had not. I continued to receive emails every single day from people. They were actually more scared now than they'd ever been before. They thought there was no way that they could become their best selves, and so why even bother starting? I realized that I had stumbled onto a psychological problem here, and I started to do a lot of research and try to figure out what was really happening. Why was fear so pervasive in our culture, and why does it prevent us from becoming our best selves? And I found a growing body of research that showed us that we were born to be pessimistic. We were born to be negative. So let me give you an example. Imagine you're an ancient caveman for a second, and you're hunting a rabbit, when out of the corner of your eyes, you see a rustling in the bushes, and you realize that there's a predator there. It's a tiger. What do you do? Do you continue to hunt the rabbit? Of course not. Surely there will be more rabbits somewhere along the lines, but one tiger, well, that's going to change your day. And so we learned anciently to overestimate threats and to undervalue opportunities. Anciently, that kept us alive. But in modern times, it keeps us from living. I've learned three ways that I've been able to break through my fears and my pain and be able to reach the other side so that I could achieve what I really wanted to accomplish. The first I learned from a playwright, an ancient Stoic by the name of Seneca. Seneca was extremely wealthy for a philosopher, which doesn't happen today. As a philosophy major, I can tell you that the only thing that studying philosophy earns you today is student debt. But Seneca, he had this massive amount of wealth. And one of his friends wrote to him one day and said, how do you do it? How do you manage to stay normal and not be so terrified of your wealth? Seneca advised him that he had a practice. Once a month, he would dress up as a vagrant. He would wear the most tattered of clothes, and he would go out into the streets, and he would eat nothing but stale bread and old food. And he would live as a homeless person for a few days. 
And after a few days had passed, he would look around at his surroundings, this terrible life that he was forced to endure, and he would ask one question. Is this what I so feared? Is this what I was so afraid of? Now, this practice had a few great advantages for Seneca. First of all, it helped him see that it really wasn't that bad. By embracing the worst-case scenario, he found out that the worst-case scenario wasn't actually something to be afraid of at all. Second, it actually showed him that he had a lot to be grateful for, things that maybe he was taking for granted no longer felt that bad. And thirdly, it showed him that the fears that he embraced were standing between him and his great objectives. The second thing that I learned really stems from this as well, and that is how great fear is in our lives. Now, if you think about the last time that you were truly afraid, what happens to your body when you become afraid? Your heart starts to beat. Your palms start to sweat. You feel adrenaline racing through you, and you become hyper-focused. Now, I have a confession today. There are two things in this world that I'm deathly afraid of. One of them, I believe, should be eradicated from the earth, but that's not my TED Talk, and I'd be talking about possums. The second thing is heights. Now, for me, anytime I'm close to the edge of a mountain or a building, uh, if I'm presenting on the 40th floor of a building, I can actually feel it swaying, and I am completely terrified. So when I go on a roller coaster, and I still go on roller coasters even though I'm afraid of heights, I find that the experience is actually better for me than it is for anyone else in the car because I'm the only one there that is 100% convinced that we are going to die. And it makes it better. It makes it more fun. If you allow your fear and your pain to create inside of you a hyper-focus, you will find that you have an advantage compared to every single other individual in the room. Use your fear. Use your pain and you will find that you'll be better for it. The third thing that I've learned to bust through fear and come out on the other side is called voluntary suffering. Now, don't be alarmed, I'm not a masochist, but I have learned that if we build a certain amount of voluntary suffering into our lives, other things aren't so bad. In the example of exercise, we go to the gym and we suffer through that hour every single morning or every single night, and we have less involuntary suffering. Our knees no longer sound like a bag of microwave popcorn. Our stomach no longer gets in the way of those who love us wanting to hold us. Everything becomes better if we embrace this involuntary suffering, or voluntary suffering. Or to put it in the words of Tim Ferriss, Tim Ferriss once said, the more voluntary suffering we build into our lives, the less involuntary suffering affects our lives. Now, when I think of the word voluntary suffering, I think of my junior high school English teacher, Miss McGordy Riggs. Now, Miss McGordy Riggs was this southern belle with this beautiful head of brown curly hair and a smile as big as the personality behind it. I hated English class, but it was impossible to hate her. From a very young age, I was a math kid. In fourth grade, my teacher actually left out an algebra book, and I stole it and became completely obsessed with learning algebra. By junior high, I was going to the high school for math, and in high school, I was going to the college, and I actually set the curve on my calculus midterms as a freshman in high school. Everyone expected me to be good at math. I was already 300 pounds, and I had huge glasses, so it kind of went with the territory. But Miss McGordy Riggs was the first English teacher who refused to accept the fact that I was a math kid. She continued to push on me, telling me that if I could learn calculus, I could surely learn how to write a sentence. An immovable object had met an unstoppable force. And I knew that the only way I could get her to stop bothering me was to learn how to do this English thing once and for all. I approached it just like I would approach mathematics. In learning sentence structure, I compared it to learning how to do proofs in trigonometry and calculus. I learned vocabulary the same way I learned other math formulas and math subjects. And I just applied the same way. But writing eluded me for months until she finally gave me an assignment I could really sink my teeth into, a Valentine's Day love letter. Now, I was in this class for the only reason a teenage boy does anything in the world for a girl. And I realized this was my chance. If I could learn to write her a love letter, she could be mine. And so I poured my heart into that assignment more than I'd ever poured my heart into anything in the world. And that love letter earned me an A. But more importantly, 
It started a love affair that's continued to this very day. No, I didn't get the girl, but I did learn to love writing. Now, here's what's so funny about this. I didn't even love math. I just did it because I was good at it and because it was easy for me. So I focused on that one subject. It is one of the worst things in our world that we allow opportunity to be overshadowed by fear and pain. If she had not challenged me and I had not learned to write, I don't know where I would be today. What today are you afraid of achieving? What today is being held back from you? I know that naturally, we are inclined to feel pain everywhere. If you think about it, if I had a hammer, there's nowhere I could not cause pain on a body. But pleasure is felt in only a few places. Your body is genetically predisposed. One negative news story stays with us for weeks, and yet positive things vanish the second anything bad happens to us. Particularly those among us who are high performers will ruminate on our mistakes until we can't think about anything else and development goes completely out the window. Now in dieting, I can tell you that that is a habit that is unlike any other. When you're learning how to play the piano, if you make a mistake, you continue on. You give your, yourself permission to make mistakes. No one makes one mistake on a piano and walks away and says, I'm never doing this again. But we do that with dieting all the time. We do that with saving money. We do that with our professional and personal lives every minute of the day. We live in an unprecedented time of negativity. The news, there's wars and rumors of wars, and regardless of which side of the aisle you're on, people are embracing xenophobia and doomsdays and negative things all around you. And you are genetically predisposed to hear and retain those messages. But we are logical beings, and there is a space in between stimulus and response. We are more than just a response to a number of actions. Leonardo da Vinci once said, people of accomplishment rarely sat back and let things happen to them. They went out and happened to things. Today, the theme of our event is, are we there yet? Where are you going? And what fears are holding you back from getting there? Are you so afraid of the pain in the future that you are allowing yourself to feel more significant pain in the present? Fear is a sign, but it does not have to be a stop sign. If we are going to go out there, we must learn to reject our genetic predisposition to pessimism. We've long ago forgotten loincloths and cave riding, and it's time to let this one go through as well. Embrace your fears. Face them in a place where you're not scared. Find that fear and allow it to focus your efforts and embrace voluntary suffering. And you will find the courage and strength, like Leonardo da Vinci, to go out and happen to things. Thank you.